Hello, welcome to Summerfest Online 2020. Thank you very much for coming along to view these presentations. Just a quick reminder that we have a number of exhibitors in the Exhibitors Hall. If you want to go along and have a quick browse, maybe do some shopping, they would love to see you. And a quick reminder too about our wonderful sponsors, Yayo Hemp Products and Butte Island Cheese. They're also in the Exhibitors Hall and they'd love to see you too. If you've enjoyed the show, please remember this is a free event. And if you'd like to make a small donation, you'd be very welcome. Please go to the Friends of VegFest page to make a donation. And a reminder too, we have another show in November, London Online, and in next March, Plant Powered Expo. And you can find out all about that on the vegfest.co.uk. Thanks very much and enjoy the presentation. Well, good morning and thank you for attending my talk. I have this slide up at the beginning because in my experience, quite a lot of people attend these vegan festivals who are possibly not yet 100% vegan. They may well be vegetarian, but wanting to become vegan and just need a bit more information, a bit more support and a bit more encouragement. Uh, and as far as I'm concerned, there's absolutely no reason why anybody shouldn't live a vegan lifestyle. So my name's Mick Walker. As well as being vegan, I'm a very keen cyclist. And some years ago, I set up a website called Vegan Cyclist UK, mostly to help spread information about the huge benefits of a plant-based lifestyle, especially with regard to health and nutrition. And I consume what is now described as a whole food plant-based diet. A little bit more about that shortly. So my talk is titled Preventing and Reversing Chronic Diseases Using an Optimal Vegan Diet which looks something like this. And in that title, there's a very important word, and that is optimal. Although I'm speaking on behalf of Plant-Based Health Professionals UK, I'm not actually a doctor, but I am a biologist. And over the last few years, I've been reading very widely about the benefits of a plant-based diet. One book that I read very recently was called Why Animals Aren't Food by Rohan Milson. In the front of the book, he had this disclaimer, which basically says that he's not a doctor and anyone reading the book should not regard it as being medical advice. So I'm making the same disclaimer for this talk. The first thing we need to do is to distinguish between the terms vegan or veganism and plant-based. The word vegan was actually coined by Donald Watson in 1944 when he founded the Vegan Society. He was looking for a word that would describe a lifestyle which involves no exploitation of animals in any shape or form whatsoever. And he simply took the first three and the last two letters of the word vegetarian and came up with the term vegan. At the moment, we're seeing a big increase in the range of vegan food products that are available in the supermarkets and also in restaurants and other food outlets. They're catering for an increasing number of people who are transitioning towards a vegan diet, or at least trying to reduce their consumption of animal products. Yes, they are certainly vegan, but they're not necessarily terribly healthy. So what does a healthy vegan diet look like? Well, it needs to be composed of whole plants. That is fruit, vegetables, beans, legumes, seeds, nuts and grains, all, all as close to their original form as possible and little if any refinement. And that will be described 
as a whole food plant-based diet, WFPB. There's a well-known proponent of whole food plant-based living in America called Dr. Caldwell Esselstyn. And he likes to call it a WFPBNO diet, no oil. A little bit more about that later. As I say, over the last few years, I've been reading very widely about the benefits of a plant-based lifestyle. And one book that I would recommend is The Rave Diet and Lifestyle by Mike Anderson, in which he explains very thoroughly the basis of a whole food plant-based diet. Some great quotes from Mike Anderson are, as far as eating is concerned, humans are the most stupid animals on the planet. We spend more time, money and resources fattening up the animals that we eat than we do feeding humans who are dying of hunger. And the greatest irony is that after all the expenses of raising these animals, we eat them and they kill us slowly. So why does Mike Anderson call his diet the rave diet? In his book, he explains that the rave diet should include no refined foods, no animal products, no vegetable oils, and there should be no exceptions. Although the final E could also mean make sure you get a reasonable amount of exercise. So what about vegetable oils? People throw their hands up in horror and say, but I thought olive oil was healthy. I thought that extra virgin olive oil was good for us. It isn't. By all means eat olives, but when the oil is removed from those olives, it represents about as refined a form of food as is possible. All the goodness of the olives has been removed and the oil is 100% fat. I think the person who first coined the phrase whole food plant-based diet was an American professor of nutritional biochemistry called T. Colin Campbell, who along with his son Thomas Campbell wrote the China study. If you haven't read the China study, then I would strongly recommend that you do. He also explains the basis of a whole food plant-based diet very thoroughly in another book called Whole. And again, I would recommend you read that if you want to understand the scientific basis of a whole food plant-based diet. I would have to say that until fairly recently, most information about whole food plant-based diets has been coming from America where an increasing number of doctors are moving away from drugs and medication and they are advising their patients on the basis of lifestyle and diet changes to deal with whatever conditions they might have. This slide shows seven such doctors, T. Colin Campbell, Neil Barnard, Michael Clapper, Caldwell Esselstyn, Michael Greger, John McDougall and Joel Furman. There are many others. Actually, Neil Barnard, Michael Clapper and Michael Greger were all here in London a fortnight ago speaking at the excellent VegMed conference, which was organised as a joint venture between ProVeg and Plant-Based Health Professionals UK. It's great to see that with the advent of Plant-Based Health Professionals UK, more and more doctors here are beginning to see the benefits of lifestyle and diet changes over drugs and medication. Of course, the idea that a plant-based diet is the healthiest type of diet isn't actually something new. Hippocrates, the father of modern medicine, famously said over 2000 years ago, let food be thy medicine and let thy medicine be food. Around a similar time, Pythagoras, also said, men dig their graves with their own teeth, 
and die more by those instruments than by all weapons of their enemies. Equally, in the New York Times of 1907, over a hundred years ago, there was an article pointing out that increasing levels of cancer may well be linked to increased consumption of meat. And Dr. Otto Warburg, who received the Nobel Prize in 1931 for his work on cancer, pointed out that cancers will not grow in alkaline environments. And we know that the consumption of animal products undoubtedly promotes acidity in the body, whereas a consumption of a whole food plant-based diet promotes an alkaline environment. Another great book about the benefits of a whole food plant-based diet is How Not to Die by Michael Greger. Obviously the book is not about how not to die ever, but rather the benefits of a whole food plant-based diet in terms of avoiding ill health and avoiding an early death. The first half of his book is comprised of 15 chapters, each of which is dedicated to a different chronic condition, all of which are preventable and reversible on a whole food plant-based diet. The 15th chapter is an interesting one. Does anyone know what iatrogenic means? Well, it means related to medical treatment. It appears that in America, the third most common cause of early death is the side effect of medication. If someone has several of these conditions, they may be seeing a number of different specialists and they may each be prescribing a different type of drug or medication. And when these drugs are taken together, it can sometimes prove to be fatal. We know that it's happening in the UK when Jeremy Hunt was the Secretary of State for Health. He admitted that as many as 20,000 people or maybe more are probably dying every year as a result of the side effects of their medication. So what exactly do we mean by chronic disease? Well, a chronic disease is a condition which is long term and which doesn't go away by itself. It doesn't really matter whether we're talking about coronary heart disease, type 2 diabetes, stroke, high blood pressure. All of these conditions essentially have a similar underlying cause, just apparent in different parts of the body. One of the big problems is chronic inflammation. Inflammation is the body's mechanism for repair. When it's short term, it's described as acute inflammation. For example, if we damage a muscle and inflammation sets in, the area of damage will typically swell, become red, warm and quite painful until the repair is complete. Michael Greger has a very good way of explaining chronic inflammation. He says, imagine banging your shin quite hard against a low coffee table. The shin will become acutely inflamed fairly quickly and it will take a short time to repair. However, if you damage the same shin in the same place every day, the damage from the previous day will not have yet been repaired and therefore the inflammation will start to become chronic. Even worse, if you damage your shin in the same place three times every day, i.e. equivalent to eating three meals, then you will undoubtedly end up with chronic inflammation. 
You know when you see people standing up and they sometimes grimace because they've got aching ankles or knees? That's basically down to chronic inflammation. Another problem is described as oxidative stress. Now obviously we need oxygen for the process of respiration. But oxygen is actually quite a corrosive gas. Think of the effect it has on iron when it causes it to rust. Our bodies release things called oxygen free radicals. And the oxygen free radicals do cause damage, oxidative damage to our cells and our tissues. It, it happens increasingly as we get older. It's actually part of the aging process. Anything that promotes the release of large amounts of oxygen free radicals is very damaging to our health. Anything which reduces or prevents the release of oxygen free radicals is hugely beneficial. You've all heard of antioxidants and we'll talk a bit more about those shortly. And then there's atherosclerosis. Now atherosclerosis refers to the laying down of fatty deposits on the inner lining of our arteries, the endothelium. It results in a narrowing of the lumen, the hole in the middle of the arteries through which the blood flows. And it therefore reduces the efficiency with which blood can flow through those arteries. Now, good health requires that our circulatory system can deliver oxygen and nutrients as efficiently as possible to all of our cells and tissues. When atherosclerosis reduces that efficiency, it's bound to be detrimental to our health. Almost unbelievably, we now know that when women are pregnant, if they consume animal products, the early signs of atherosclerosis are actually detectable in the arteries of their babies at birth. Living in our gut, in our digestive system, are huge numbers of bacteria. Indeed, the populations run into the trillions. And it's absolutely impossible to over-exaggerate the crucial importance of these bacteria towards our health. What we know is that by consuming animal products and refined foods, a lot of the beneficial bacteria are killed off and they're replaced by less than healthy bacteria. And the unhealthy bacteria promote what is described as a leaky gut, also promoted by the consumption of saturated fats from animal products. And a leaky gut is, as the name suggests, a gut where the cells lining the intestine move slightly apart, creating larger pores through which molecules which we wouldn't normally absorb can pass from our intestine into our blood. These might include slightly larger protein molecules which can trigger the immune system and other molecules which can prove to be quite toxic. This is the book that I referred to earlier on, Why Animals Aren't Food, written by a guy called Rohan Milson. There are about 800 pages in this book and it's an incredibly comprehensive explanation as to why animal products and refined foods are poor for our health and why consuming whole plants is beneficial for our health. Rohan Milson divides what people eat into three categories, meat, junk and plants. And he describes the people that consume them as meaters, junkers 
and planters. And he is in no doubt whatsoever that the meat and the junk should not be regarded as food, that meaters and junkers are putting their health at risk by consuming those products and that the only healthy people on the planet are the planters, the people who are living on a whole food, plant-based diet. So what is wrong with consuming meat, dairy and eggs? In the first 150 pages or so of his book, Rohan Milson lists all the molecules and compounds that are present in animal products and which are detrimental to our health. Obviously, I can't list them all here, but they would include saturated fats and cholesterol, which promote atherosclerosis and a leaky gut. Nitrites, some of these are natural, some of them are added, as in the case of processed meats, and they are converted into other molecules which are carcinogenic. During the cooking process, compounds called polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons are formed and they are carcinogenic. Arachidonic acid is an omega-6 fatty acid found in animal products and causes inflammation. Advanced glycation end products or ages, these do age us because they promote inflammation and oxidative stress. Heterocyclic amines are carcinogenic. A compound called trimethylamine N oxide, better known as TMAO. Now this is made from carnitine and choline in meat made by the unhealthy gut bacteria which are promoted by the consumption of animal products and this compound promotes inflammation and atherosclerosis. Animal protein, we now know that animal protein is not a healthy source of protein. We're far better off obtaining our protein from plant sources. Amongst other things, animal protein tends to be high in amino acids which contain sulfur and it also stimulates the production of a compound called insulin-like growth factor one, something which is also present in milk. Acrylamide. Acrylamide is formed in all food that is cooked at a high temperature, especially animal products. Although things like chips or crisps or anything which is fried at a high temperature will contain appreciable amounts of acrylamide but not as much as you will find in animal products. Endotoxins. Animal products are covered in bacteria. It doesn't matter how hygienically they might be prepared, those bacteria produce toxic waste products. And when we consume those animal products, we're consuming those toxic molecules and they cause inflammation. Casein, the protein that's found in milk, it's highly carcinogenic. Indeed, T. Colin Campbell reckons that casein is probably the most potent carcinogen consumed by human beings. A compound called N-glycolyl neuraminic acid or NEU5GC. It's only found in animal products and it promotes inflammation and atherosclerosis. Another omega-6 linoleic acid, it promotes inflammation. And heme. Heme is the compound which contains iron that's found in red meat. It is not a healthy source of iron. Indeed, it is highly oxidative and leads to considerable amounts of oxidative stress. Sadly, there's a considerable amount of environmental pollution on this planet. And unfortunately, there's not a lot we can do to prevent these polluting molecules from ending up in the food that we eat. They are described as being persistent. That is, they don't break down, they don't biodegrade, and they remain in the environment for very long periods of time. 
they are bioaccumulative they become more and more concentrated as they pass through food chains and food webs and they are toxic they're poisonous and detrimental to our health one such pollutant is mercury which is a particular problem in aquatic ecosystems we know that pretty much all the fish consumed by humans is heavily contaminated with mercury some of the pollutants are manufactured organic compounds which have been made to be used as pesticides insecticides herbicides and so on the use of some of them like DDT has been banned for a considerable period of time in many parts of the world but because it doesn't break down there is still DDT around in the environment today there are compounds called polychlorinated biphenols, PCBs. These are used in industry as lubricants and insulators, and they're very toxic when they end up in our food. As I've already said, some of these problems are particularly acute in aquatic ecosystems, but bioaccumulation occurs equally in terrestrial ecosystems, in terrestrial food chains and food webs. And it makes sense to avoid eating high levels of these pollutants to obtain our food as early in the food chain as possible. The earliest place we can obtain our food from is at the beginning with plants. The more we consume further along the food chain, i.e. animals, the more of these toxic compounds we are going to consume. In addition, to the toxic nature of consuming animal products. Another major problem is that animal products contain no fiber whatsoever. The only place we can obtain our fiber is from plants. And it would be impossible to overemphasize the huge importance of fiber in our diet and to promote good health. More about that shortly. I'm not going to say anything about refined or processed foods, but I thought I'd recommend a couple of books if you're interested. This is one that I read fairly recently and the title says it all really, Salt, Sugar and Fat. Suffice to say that it would appear that the CEOs of the major processed food companies tend not to eat their own products. And if you haven't come across it before, I would recommend Fast Food Nation by Eric Schlosser, which is an eye-opening account of the horrors of the fast food industry. So what is it about the consumption of plants that is so beneficial to the promotion of our good health. Well, here's the thing. Plants, by definition, need to be directly exposed to the rays of the sun. They need to be able to absorb sunlight to carry out the process of photosynthesis. Now, the rays of the sun are potentially just as harmful to plants as they are to us. And therefore, during the course of evolution, plants have had to be able to create thousands upon thousands of molecules whose main role is to help protect them from the harmful rays of the sun and potential damage. We don't appear to produce those molecules because it's clear that we've been able to get them from plants as part of our diet. And because they're designed to help protect against damage, they also help to protect us against damage and promote good health. One such group of molecules are the carotenoids. They're a large group of yellow, orange, and red plant pigments. We're always told that we really should be eating the rainbow. Eat colorful plants. That's because they contain large amounts of these protective molecules. 
Carotenoids are very strong antioxidants and they reduce inflammation. And good sources of them are kale, broccoli, peppers, tomatoes, carrots and watermelon. Flavonoids and lignans belong to a huge group of phytochemicals called polyphenols. They're also strong antioxidants and reduce inflammation. Good sources of them include blueberries, very high in antioxidants. Broccoli, actually broccoli is one of the sort of wonder foods. If in doubt, eat broccoli. Cabbage, raw cacao, strawberries, green tea. And lignans are present in particularly high levels in seeds like flax and pumpkin. Other groups of flavonoids include the isoflavones and the phytoestrogens, which are found in high levels in soy products and other legumes. Now, the consumption of soy is seen as being slightly controversial in that there is a thought that the phytoestrogen molecules could well mimic the human female hormone oestrogen and promote the development of such things as breast cancer. In fact, in those parts of the world where soy has been consumed in large amounts for a considerable period of time, often in the form of tofu and tempeh, in fact, these areas have remarkably low levels of heart disease, osteoporosis and breast cancer. And it seems certain that rather than promoting the development of things like breast cancer, phytoestrogens, in fact, are highly protective. I said earlier that it is impossible to overemphasize the importance of fiber in the diet. This is Dr. Dennis Burkett, who over 50 years ago was promoting the need to have high levels of fiber in a healthy diet. In fact, he spent a lot of time in Africa where he was working as a missionary. And in traveling around, one of the things he noticed was a lack of chronic disease when it was already starting to become a problem here in the UK. And he linked this to the traditional diet that was being consumed in many of the villages that he visited. And that diet was largely plant-based and included very high levels of fiber. And he reached the conclusion that for the promotion of good health, for the avoidance of a whole range of chronic conditions, it is desirable to have around 35 to 40 grams of fiber in our diet every day. And the only place we can get that is whole plants. In fact, it's very clear that a high level of fiber in our diet undoubtedly lowers body weight, lowers systolic blood pressure, and helps to reduce total cholesterol levels. In addition, Dennis Burkitt was absolutely clear that it is a lack of dietary fiber that promotes a whole range of conditions, including type 2 diabetes and colorectal cancer. There are certain products on the supermarket shelves, various cereals, for example, claiming to be high in fiber. However, in order to obtain enough of the right sort of fiber, it's crucial that we obtain it from whole plants, from grains, legumes, fruits and vegetables. It's interesting how people are beginning to understand the importance of fibre in our diet. And only this year, an article was published in the Journal of the American Medical Association basically saying exactly what Dennis Burkitt was saying 
over 50 years ago that a high fibre diet might protect against a range of conditions. In the article, one of the things they say is that a higher intake of fibre, especially cereal fibre, has been linked to improved insulin sensitivity, lipid profile, endothelial function and reduced inflammation, all of which help to reduce the development of chronic conditions. Now earlier I also mentioned the importance of bacteria in our digestive system. It is now clear that the consumption of the right amounts of the right type of fibre every day hugely promote the development of populations of very beneficial bacteria. And we now know that such bacteria partially digest some of the fibre as a result of which they produce some molecules called short chain fatty acids, butyrate, propionate and acetate. And that these molecules have a significant anti-inflammatory effect and they also help to promote a very healthy immune system. And finally, nitric oxide. Now, nitric oxide is a compound which all of our cells produce, but it's particularly important that it should be produced by the cells of the endothelium, the cells which line the inner surface of our arteries. And in doing so, it helps to promote the health of those arteries. So what does it do? Well, basically, nitric oxide helps to produce nice, flexible arteries. It's important that those arteries should be able to constrict and dilate when necessary in order to produce an efficient flow of blood to deliver all the oxygen and nutrients to our various cells and tissues. In order to produce nitric oxide, we need good levels of nitrates in our diet. And the best sources of nitrates are green leafy vegetables. So we need to eat plenty of green leafy vegetables in order to maintain the health of our arteries. If you haven't already seen it, I would strongly recommend that you try and see the recently released documentary, The Game Changers. It's about a group of top athletes who all absolutely thrive on a whole food plant-based diet. It's available on Netflix. I believe it is the most downloaded film ever released by Netflix. And it would appear, not surprisingly, that it is now encouraging an increasing number of people to consider transitioning across to a whole food plant-based diet. In the Game Changers, in order to demonstrate one of the benefits of a whole food plant-based diet, a doctor provides three young men with a meal which is very heavily meat-based. Sometime after consuming the meal, he takes blood samples from them, which he places in a centrifuge. And this is the result. The yellow bit at the top is the blood plasma and it looks rather cloudy. The following day he repeats the experiment but this time he provides them with a meal based entirely around whole plants. And the result is rather different. The plasma here is really quite clear compared with the one following the meat-based meal. Now the reason why the one on the right is cloudy is because the plasma contains large amounts of fat or molecules called triglycerides. These make the blood quite a bit more viscous and they slow down the flow of the blood 
and they take around six hours to disappear. So that means if somebody consumes animal products for breakfast, lunch, and in the evening, the blood's going to be more or less like that for around about 18 hours. Clearly, the consumption of a whole food plant-based diet is considerably more effective in terms of maintaining a healthy blood plasma. So, in the light of all this evidence, why are more people not moving over to a whole food plant-based diet? Well, a lot of people are, but there are still many who regard it as being extreme. They would rather have the surgery, take the drugs and medication and continue with their unhealthy diet. So many people don't realize that the existence of chronic disease is almost entirely down to diet. They think that chronic disease is just a normal part of the human condition and therefore it's okay to continue to take drugs and medication and it's just too much of an effort to completely change one's lifestyle. Another problem is that the meat, dairy and egg industries are huge and they don't want everybody to move to a whole food plant-based diet. Equally, they don't want people to realize that the huge amount of chronic disease is directly linked to the consumption of their products. And at the same time, the availability of cheap fast food is so convenient to so many people. When it's available, they would much rather consume such unhealthy food than consider a complete change in their lifestyles. Although there are increasing numbers of people moving over to vegan, whole food, plant-based diets, uh, there are still many who are resisting such a move and find it much more convenient just to ignore what is happening and continue with their unhealthy diet and lifestyle. However, looking on the bright side, there may well come a time when we look back with horror on the consumption of meat, dairy and eggs.